Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, my name is Sebastian Malaby. I work here uh, at the Council. So I want to welcome you all to uh, today's uh, CFR meeting. This is part of the uh, Peter McCullough series on international economics. Um, I want to welcome also CFR members uh, around the nation and the world participating in this meeting through live stream. Um, I think you know this is going to be on the record. Uh, there's an introduction and description and, uh, of, Mr. of Secretary Liu's bio, I think, in your packs. But just to say that uh, he was sworn as the, as the 76th Treasury Secretary in 2013. Uh, before that, he ran the OMB. And uh, one thing I remember as being kind of relevant to what he's going to be discussing today is before that, in the early Obama administration, when he was uh, Deputy Secretary of State and running the uh, first ever sort of uh, deep look at all the tools of development uh, assistance across the US government, uh, the, the Quadrennial Development Review, uh, shows that his involvement in these questions of the interaction between uh, economics and statecraft uh, is rather extensive. Um, so I'm going to welcome Secretary Liu up to the podium, and uh, he's going to speak for a bit, uh, and then we're going to have a conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sebastian, for that introduction and for your leadership at the Council. Um, this is a remarkable institution with a long history of intellectual influence on America's foreign policy. And as always, it's an honor uh, to be here today. America's leadership in the global economy is something we all care deeply about. Uh, and I want to thank Gideon and his foreign affairs team for publishing my essay on this topic. The piece opens with a story. Uh, about the difficulty of getting IMF quota reform through Congress. And it asks, why was it so hard? Why was it so hard and did it take five years to win approval uh, at the end of last year? After all, the IMF has been a symbol of US leadership uh, since its birth at the end of World War II. And along with the World Bank and the World Trade Organization, it's provided the underlying architecture of a global economic system that's helped produce remarkable gains over the past 70 plus years. American leadership was essential to the creation of that system and the progress that it's yielded. Yet even though it's supported the well-being of our citizens and has helped the United States advance our values and our foreign policy objectives, America's global economic leadership has not always been popular here at home. In the case of IMF quota reform, it took five years to convince Congress to act, a delay that led many in the international community to question America's leadership position in the global economy. The ultimate passage of IMF reform was pivotal, but it was just one of many important steps needed to sustain our economic leadership and adapt it to the challenges of our time. We know that the global landscape of the next century will be very different than that of the post-war era. And if we want it to work for the American people, we need to embrace new players on the global economic stage and make sure that they meet the standards of the system we created and that we have a strong say in any new standards. The worst possible outcome would be to step away from our leadership role and let others fill in behind us. Making the case for global engagement is a responsibility we all share. And we must make the choices necessary to ensure both the future of the international architecture we built and America's position in it. Over the last year, the Obama administration has made significant progress advancing US leadership in the global economy. We worked with Congress to secure IMF reform, trade promotion authority, and the reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. We reached agreement with our international partners on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, landmark climate agreement, the Iran nuclear deal, and a stepped-up strategy to confront terrorist financing. But to ensure the benefits of our global role, that those benefits remain available in future generations, we have more work ahead of us. Since its establishment in 1944, the Bretton Woods system of cooperation has evolved and endured by providing a foundation for mutual economic gain that could not be achieved by individual countries alone. Since 1950, real per capita income worldwide has quadrupled, raising living standards for billions of people, extending life expectancies, and expanding access to education. Clear rules for global economic relations create opportunities and incentives to innovate, invest, and work, the critical drivers of economic progress. 
But a system of mutual responsibility does not automatically enforce itself. It requires responsible American leadership. It also requires constant improvement to raise standards and create better mechanisms to ensure that countries keep their commitments, refrain from unfair competitive behavior, and cooperate to confront new challenges. The rules-based system was a major reason that the global financial crisis never turned into a second Great Depression. The United States and other nations were able to coordinate efforts through the G20 and the IMF to avoid the downward spiral of protectionism and predatory macroeconomic policies that characterized previous eras. The world's major economies, the United States, the Eurozone, Japan, and China, launched simultaneous economic stimulus programs and mobilized financial assistance to vulnerable parts of the global system. We've built on that cooperation in recent years to advance important U.S. goals, including the IMF's response to fiscal stress caused by the Ebola epidemic in 2014 and its support for Ukraine following Russia's aggression in Crimea. The scale and speed of assistance in both instances would not have been possible if the United States had to act alone or to stitch together donor contributions. The simple fact is that international financial institutions amplify U.S. influence on the global stage. We've also worked closely with partners to implement financial sanctions that show how this same global financial architecture can be used to persuade malign actors to abandon behavior that threatens peace and security. The Iran Agreement is a direct result of the financial pressure imposed by an unprecedented global coalition. And we have and continue to work closely with our allies to impose costs on Russia for its actions in Ukraine and on entities that are abetting North Korea's nuclear violations. But the benefits of international coordination and our international standing cannot be taken for granted, and we must take the necessary steps to preserve and strengthen our position. Responsible and sustainable U.S. leadership in the global economic system begins at home. And we have to lead by example, as we did by bouncing back from the financial crisis that threatened America's place in the global economy. The U.S. economy has now produced the longest streak of uninterrupted private sector job growth in American history. Between 2009 and 2015, the budget deficit has declined from nearly 10% of GDP to 2.5%. An improved financial regulation has helped address the causes of the crisis, producing a better capitalized and more stable financial system. Yet along the way, political brinksmanship led some to question America's capacity to meet this moment of leadership. The threat of government shutdowns and default heightened global anxieties. And Washington's inability to reach a consensus on domestic priorities, such as rebuilding aging infrastructure and reforming the broken business tax code, priorities with bipartisan support creates unnecessary risks to America's future economic strength. Recent advances, including multi-year budget targets, the passage of Trade Promotion Authority, and the reauthorization of the Export Import Bank have demonstrated that we have the capacity to work together to make important progress, but much more work remains. Beyond our borders, the world's economic challenges will not end with the current administration, nor will the ongoing agenda for U.S. leadership. And there are a number of priorities that we must continue to press. First, we must work with our partners to further modernize the IMF, allowing it to intensify its scrutiny of critical issues like exchange rates, current account imbalances, and shortfalls in global aggregate demand. Because more information means better policy cooperation and more efficient financial markets, the IMF should continue to promote greater transparency among its members when it comes to economic data, especially as it relates to foreign reserves. Second, we must work with our partners to make the World Bank and the regional development banks more efficient and effective. These institutions need to have the resources and policy expertise to help countries promote sustainable development and address challenges like state fragility, forced migration, natural disasters, and disease epidemics. They must also be able to mobilize resources that cut carbon emissions and build societies resilient to climate change. Third. We must help modernize the global trading system by pushing for innovative features in new trade agreements. TPP, for example, includes strengthened labor and environmental provisions, robust protections for trade and services, and controls on the behavior of state-owned enterprises to ensure fair competition. Under the agreement, members have also pledged to avoid manipulating exchange rates. These high standards need to be the model for future agreements. Fourth. 
To prevent a repeat of the financial crisis, we must continue to lead efforts to reform the international financial regulatory system. U.S. leadership in this area has already resulted in more rigorous capital standards for banks, greater transparency in the derivatives market, and stronger tools for managing the failure of financial institutions. With many of the critical standard-setting reforms in place, the focus must shift to comprehensive and consistent implementation and close attention to emerging threats. Fifth, we must continue to combat terrorist financing, corruption, money laundering, and other financial crimes. The Treasury is strengthening its anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing rules at home, working through the Financial Action Task Force to improve enforcement globally, and partnering with countries to combat terrorist financing specifically against ISIL. Because we must keep up with innovation in the private sector and by our adversaries, regulators must update their regimes while ensuring regulations do not impede legitimate provision of financial services, especially to the underserved. Finally, we're committed to building on the progress that we've made in cooperating with emerging market partners, including Brazil, Argentina, India, and Mexico, on key priorities such as facilitating investment, improving the implementation of tax policies, promoting financial inclusion, and combating money laundering and terrorist financing. As the two largest economies, the United States and China also have a unique responsibility to work together to advance shared prosperity, maintain a constructive global economic order, and make progress on critical challenges like climate change. This year, we'll hold the seventh U.S.-China Strategic and Economic Dialogue, which is a platform that has strengthened relations between our two countries and provided a forum for discussing important priorities, like China's shift toward consumption-led growth and greater transparency and predictability in its policymaking. While the progress of the last year has helped to advance this important agenda, we cannot take our global role for granted, and we must always think about how our choices will affect our leadership in the future. With vision and foresight, previous generations of Americans have provided a foundation on which to advance our values and build a prosperous future for the United States and other countries. Our task now is to strengthen that architecture and adapt it to new challenges. If we come together and accomplish this, we'll not only support today's prosperity, we'll also ensure that the next generation of Americans inherits an even stronger platform for navigating tomorrow's economic landscape. Thank you very much. Great, so we have a bit more than 45 minutes and we're gonna divide that between a conversation up here and then we're gonna to go to uh, the members. There's a lot of talent I can see in the room, so uh, I do wanna uh, hear from people. Um, but I thought I'd start by just, you know, in a, in a, in a slightly cheeky way, quest questioning the premise. Um, you lay out this view uh, that the Bretton Woods institutions embed uh, US values, uh, expand Western influence, and I think this is the council, most people are gonna agree with that for the most part. Um, but um, you could also observe that the central feature of the Bretton Woods architecture when it was adopted in 1944 was actually a fixed exchange rate regime. And that was probably the most important single part of it, and it was dumped by Richard Nixon unceremoniously in 1971. And then the world moved on, and we found that actually floating exchange rates for large parts of the global economy were good. Um, and so I want to ask you to sort of look <laughs> forward and ask a quick critical question about the, the sort of central theme of your essay, which is to say, maybe there are bits of the international financial architecture that we shouldn't necessarily support, that might be dispensable, that might not be around in 10 years. Can you think of any that you do not think of as indispensable? Uh, you know, Sebastian, I think that the key is to think of the international architecture as an evolving, adapting set of institutions. Um, the world at the end of World War II looked so different than it does today. Uh, the role of the United States was so different than it is today, and it wasn't good. It wasn't good that the rest of the world had uh, lost its manufacturing capacity, that there was no other hard currency that uh, had any even promise of being an alternative to the dollar. And um, the, the system that evolved provided a foundation between the 1940s and the 1970s to see a period of growth that has led to not just economic uh, growth, but 
geopolitical stability. Some of the political developments in the 70s, 80s, and 90s show that when you move towards a more market-oriented system, when you're sharing a set of values, political reforms tend to follow. Um, I think as we go forward, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that the world isn't going to look in 10, 20, or 30 years exactly the way it looks today. The thing that we need to make sure from a U.S. perspective as a constant is that we have a role in those institutions to help govern how they change as they go along. We can't look at it as being completely frozen in time, or others will just decide that they're going to group together in a, a different set of organizations where they make different rules. I think the thing about the, the IMF, the World Bank, um, are that they're institutions that are very inclusive. Um, there's a, a, a very strong U.S. role that we've earned. Um, and going forward, I think these institutions have to be looking at the challenges of the future. Uh, you, you asked about the IMF, but let me kind of shift and, and give an answer perhaps a little bit more about the World Bank. Um, you know, we have, over the last year, seen the World Bank play a very important role in the discussions on climate change. Um, we, you know, we've seen uh, the development of, of, of lending facilities that are designed to deal with challenges of the future, which is governmental and public-private partnerships to invest in the kinds of uh, things that will lead to a cleaner environment. Uh, at the IMF, uh, you know, you, if you look at the, the uh, period between 2008 and now, um, it has played a, an enormously significant role both in stabilizing the, the post-financial crisis environment and also in responding to the crises. I mentioned two in my remarks, Ebola and Ukraine. We don't know what those challenges in the future will be. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone predicted Ebola uh, you know, even a month before it became an international crisis. What we know is we need to have flexible international bodies. To go to Congress to get funding to deal with something in short term like Ebola is a challenge. Let me ask, let's take both of those, the World Bank and the IMF, since you've, you've raised both of them uh, as sort of key institutions of the order created in 1944. So um, in terms of the World Bank, uh, I think it's certainly true that uh, the governance system on the board has neither the disadvantages of the UN Security Council, which is way too narrow for a world in which other powers have risen, nor the disadvantage of the UN General Assembly, which is way too democratic, frankly. Um, so that strikes me as uh, an incontestable point. But the tools of the World Bank's lending um, feel to me as if this evolution that you're mentioning uh, might be accelerated somewhat. So for example, um, the IBRD, the main lending window, which lends at um, you know, uh, interest rates that, that cover the World Bank's costs, so they're sub-market, but they're not a giveaway. Um, you know, the premise was uh, a world in which the clients did not have access to global capital markets. That premise is out of the window. Uh, they all do have access to commercial, private uh, capital. So what's the residual rationale? The classic answer would be there are certain things like global public goods, climate being a good example, where you want um, more lending than the market would deliver. Uh, for those things because they're global public goods. Sin single countries don't have an interest in creating enough of them. But as I understand it, the IBRD's lending interest rates do not differentiate. They don't give you a break, a cheaper interest rate, if you're borrowing to create a global public good. Shouldn't that, isn't that a clear case where? where? And I, I think if you, if you look at the discussions um, that we had just last year uh, at Addis Ababa at the Funding for Development uh, Conference, um, it kind of illustrates your point uh, of being kind of in between the Security Council and General Assembly. There were very um, uh, significant debates about how much um, uh, World Bank resource should be put into climate. You know, there was a debate about whether it was competing with more traditional forms of lending um, or whether it should be all additive um, and I think it was resolved in a way that was really quite constructive, where the World Bank became a major partner in making resources available to deal with what is one of the most pressing public goods of our generation, dealing with investing in a, in a, in a, a more energy efficient, less carbon intensive but, but future. Just, but, but just to press you, right now, there is a surge just reported 
in IBRD lending, which is driven by the uh, budget gaps in countries like Nigeria, which have had resource crashes, and where the private markets are being less accommodative in lending for general bud budget expenditures. So a, a large portion of what the bank does is kind of substituting, complementing, competing, however you want to see it, with the uh, private capital markets. It's not creating global public goods. I think it's a mistake to think of any of these institutions as dealing with one um, challenge. Uh, they, the, dealing with um, maintaining f uh, basic uh, financial stability in a country is certainly core to what the IMF is, even though the IMF does many things uh, beyond that. The World Bank has traditionally uh, helped to shore up systems uh, which meet the standards that are set by entities like the IMF uh, to, uh, to be on a sustainable path. Um, I think having multiple points of access to make sure that you avoid the destabilizing uh, consequences of uh, uh, you know, having either cyclical or price shock uh, effects that uh, lead to economic and political destabilization is very important. It's not that you choose between doing climate change or the other. The question is how do you strike the right balance? Um, I think that one of the things that the World Bank uh, has done over the last few years is looked at how to uh, manage its resources creatively to gain uh, a bit of, uh, of, of reach through better management of, it, of its financial uh, uh, capabilities uh, to, to be in more places. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, uh, if, if you look at the, the countries that are on the cusp of um, kind of shifting from developing to developed countries, they tend to still be places where you find a lot of poverty. So it's not as if once your overall economy reaches the next level, the benefits of that are necessarily as broadly shared um, as needs to be. But if, the, if, but if the government of a middle-income country wants to reduce poverty, you know, let's take China or, or India, uh, it can borrow commercially to do projects which are focused on poverty reduction. Having the bank there the, the World Bank there to be an additional source of, I mean, either the government wants to do these projects or it doesn't. I, I think that um, there is a, a period uh, in that transition when uh, the, the government wanting to do it uh, the, and, and the ability to do it um, are not totally matched up. And that's where I think having uh, international financial institutions, uh, this is not concessional financing. I mean, I think that we have to maintain the principle that below market rate uh, lending is restricted to the poorest countries, um, and you know that is a, a, a something that comes under pressure on a regular basis. Let, let me switch a little bit from development. If I can, Sebastian, yeah, sure. I think it's also important to develop um, new um, new instruments. Uh, you know, we're seeing now in refugee crises that there are um, there are geopolitical situations that create surges of need. Um, and uh, there aren't necessarily the tools in place uh, to deal with where those needs show up in a timely way. And one of the discussions that's underway now is how to make sure that you have a facility that can step in in a case like a refugee crisis, where in one sense it's a global problem, but in another sense it has a very local uh, dimension because people end up in a concentrated uh, place or set of places. I think that's an important conversation for the 21st century. We're seeing right now the challenge of dealing with that, and that's something that institutions like the World Bank are set up to th think through. We're doing it now in a way that's adapting old tools for a new challenge. Um, and that's why the, this idea of adaptation is so key. You have to be nimble enough to deal with the problems that you face today and that you're likely to face in the future, not always looking backwards. So on the subject of financial crisis management, um, your essay and your remarks uh, both draw attention to the IMF's role after 2008. But I think um, it probably is fair to argue that bilateral swaps between the Federal Reserve and other economies that were in desperate need of dollars were bigger in aggregate and more decisive. Uh, and that is a trend that ain't going away because the sheer volume of cross-border claims has grown so much that even an expanded IMF with more resources uh, is going to have trouble being big enough uh, to deal with what happens to South Korea when suddenly uh, there's a massive flight to safety in the US and dollar 
dollars flow back into the US, and then you have to have the Fed recycling them. So as you think about that, um, in the next big financial crisis globally, I mean, the IMF will be there to deal with medium-sized things like Ukraine. But in, in, in a bigger sense, big crises, isn't it really a case of central banks dealing with each other? Well, I'll leave the question of Fed swap lines to the Fed, and, um, which has the, the authority to make those decisions. But I think if you look at the financial crisis and the response to it, the IMF played a critical role. Um, it was part of country plans uh, in a number of critical uh, instances where if you had not stabilized those economies, we would have seen a new bottom that was um, far worse than the bottom uh, we ended up uh, hitting. Um, there was a, a sense that there was somewhere to go, which psychologically had a very important effect. And I think if you look at the role of the United States, I don't think um, it is a, a, a defensible notion that the United States is going to respond to every global crisis uh, on its own unilaterally. While the Ukraine example may be a medium-sized country, um, look at the numbers that were involved. I mean, a $17 billion IMF program. You know, we've done three $1 billion loan guarantees, you know, which at credit budget scoring terms are less than a billion dollars of budget exposure. Um, the leverage that we got by being part of a larger effort you know, is just the difference between making a difference and not. Ukraine's economy turned you know, from negative to neutral to maybe positive um, faster than anyone thought, and our loan guarantees alone wouldn't have been enough uh, to accomplish that. I think one of the things that's happened since the financial crisis is that the IMF has developed some uh, new tools. Um, the flexible credit lines are being used in a different way and, and more effectively. Um, there, with quota reform, we have recapitalized uh, the IMF, taken the money um, and put it in the main uh, fund uh, itself. Um, so I think right now the IMF has considerable resources. We do have to ask the question always, um, what would be the consequence of the next crisis? you don't have the luxury of knowing the precise contours of a crisis until it's upon you, which is why you have to have the tools in place, but also the adaptability. Look what happened after the financial crisis. The new arrangement to borrow was funded rather quickly to put in the IMF the facility that could deal with that crisis. If you had to create an IMF out of whole cloth, um, you couldn't have put that in place uh, so quickly. And I don't believe that any one country, not even the United States, could have had that amount of firepower. So uh, you make in your essay a, a case, uh, and a persuasive one, that um, notwithstanding the governance advantage that the fund and the bank begin with, uh, quota reform has been constructive because you're allowing emerging nations to have a larger voice and stake in the international system. So I'm wondering if you would apply the same logic uh, to the question of global reserve currencies. So right now you have the dollar uh, very dominant. Uh, you have the Chinese explicitly saying that they don't like that and they would prefer to internationalize the renminbi and make it a, a rival uh, or at least another, another reserve currency. Um, you have various others expressing frustration with the dominance of the dollar. Some of it's uninformed, but it's, it's a sentiment that's definitely out there. Um, would it be in the U.S. national interest if more global funding, including by the private sector, took place in the form of issuing renminbi debt instead of dollar debt? Obviously, it's a marketplace that decides uh, these questions fundamentally. And I think um, it is a fair statement that at the moment there is really no um, uh, likely uh, competitor to take the place of the United States and the dollar. The reason I raise the question in the essay is that we can't just think about the next year or two. We have to think in decades, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And anyone sitting uh, you know, in a North Korea sanctions, you know, that, that's a challenge. We always have to maintain the ability of the US to act unilaterally in our own national interest. But we have to do it in a way that's mindful of the fact that we have something that gives us power and leverage and economic strength. And that's something we need to also keep an eye on protecting. Um, you know, I think you look at, at, at the, the, the current uh, kind of global economic situation and, you know, it probably you'd have to say 
today, it will be a longer period of time that we have uh, than you would have said maybe five years ago uh, because the United States has recovered from the Great Recession in a way that really demonstrates the resilience of the U.S. economy. And notwithstanding the noise of our political process, the ability of our political system to respond in a timely manner. Um, I think when you look at a currency like the, the RMB, the, the challenge is going to be for China to make the kinds of changes that it needs to make uh, to have its currency be truly convertible, to have its markets be truly open uh, to foreign investment and, um, and, 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 and to, to, to services and goods from abroad. Um, I think that they've made progress. That's, it's clear that they've made progress, but they're not all the way there. They still have uh, work to do, and you know, the, the reason that's an area where we engage at a considerable amount of detail is it's an area where China's economic leadership knows they have to make these kinds of changes for China's economy to be where it needs to be in 10, 20, 30 years. So it's an area of common uh, interest potentially, but potentially also of conflict. I, I, let me just pursue this because if your answer is, is, is provoking and I want to ask one more question then I'm going to come to the, to the members in the audience. So you, your essay does this good job of highlighting the dilemma that because of the position of the US dollar in the global system, it gives one the opportunity to uh, exercise sanctions power and that this is a tool of statecraft that future presidents will be glad to have because it, it's short of war and avoids doing nothing. Um, so that is all stipulated and point well taken. Um, um, so there's balance between use of sanctions, not overuse, because if you use it too much, you will incentivize people to move outside the dollar system. But I'm thinking about a different dilemma, which is the Triffin dilemma, namely that whoever is the reserve, uh, the, the issue of the reserve currency um, is issuing safe assets that will protect value during a crisis. So people around the world are going to want that safe asset as insurance. They're going to come and buy lots of US dollar debt because it's safe. Uh, and because it becomes easy to issue US dollar debt, uh, the US will almost by definition issue too much dollar debt. Um, uh, and, and as a result, there will be these cycles where the indebtedness of the US becomes a problem that threatens the very stability that the US has been creating uh, for most of the time. Uh, and the way out, you know, one consequence of that, 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 that position is a constant inflow of capital uh, into the US, which uh, makes um, the dollar stronger, which creates the current account deficit, which creates these global imbalances, you know, which then you would like the IMF to go police, uh, right? So, so some of the things that trouble us in the international order, you know, excess uh, US indebtedness, um, global imbalances, and so forth, do have their origins in an extreme reliance on the dollar globally. <coughs> Hence my question, would it be better um, to, uh, you know, encourage, you could, do, you could imagine policies that would encourage private actors uh, to use other capital markets more. You could make it more restrictive, harder for uh, corporates uh, from Asia to come issue US dollar bonds. You know, I, I think that the, the US financial markets have the leadership role they have in the world uh, because of um, all of the things that make the United States the United States. It's, a, it's our political stability, it's our resilience, it's, our, it's the depth and liquidity of our markets, particularly our treasury markets. Those are all good things, um, and I don't want to change uh, that. Actually, I want to protect that. That's really the, one of the main points that I'm, that I'm making. I think when it comes to fiscal uh, policy, um, we ought not to take our ability to borrow infinitely as license um, to borrow infinitely. And you know, I, I've had two tours at the Office of Management and Budget. During one of them, we ran a, a balanced budget and a surplus. During the second, we dug, dug our way out of a very deep hole that we got into in the intervening years. We need to look on the horizon. We've made great progress in this administration, uh, reducing the deficit by three quarters as a percentage of GDP, stabilizing the debt as a percentage of GDP, and creating a window where we now have time to deal with the longer term fiscal challenges on a stable foundation. Um, you know, that's something that's going to be a challenge that has to be undertaken uh, anew. Uh, but I don't think our ability to borrow infinitely uh, ought to be uh, viewed as uh, a justification for, uh, for ignoring that uh, over the long term, 
maintaining stable fiscal policy is very important to our national strength. We've achieved a great deal in this administration to repair the damage uh, that was done both by policies and by recession. Um, uh, but going forward, uh, it, 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 it's going to be a come responsibility for a new team to take a, a stable economy and look at the period beyond the horizon. The indebtedness problem is not just a government debt problem. No, I understand. It's, it's, a private. it's private, and yeah. uh, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we, we saw a period where, uh, frankly, we were seeing uh, inadequate access to debt in this country. Uh, it's only in the last few years that we've seen uh, businesses uh, and individuals have the kind of better access to credit that they should have. I mean, I think that families have improved their balance sheets. Businesses are sitting on a great deal of uh, capital right now. So I think the, the current practices, uh, if anything, are on the recovering uh, uh, part of the curve. Where it goes beyond uh, is, is a question, but we're a long way away from the kind of uh, easy borrowing uh, that we saw in the decade before the, the financial crisis. I mean, I think the challenge we have is how do you make sure that you don't lend to individuals and, and firms that are not credit worthy um, uh, just because uh, they want to borrow. On the other hand, how do we make sure that individuals and firms that are credit worthy have access to the credit that they need both for their family needs and to invest particularly in small and medium sized enterprises? We're not seeing as much investment as I would like to see uh, in some of these areas. I wish that the, the, we've tried actually to ease the credit box because we think that for mortgage lending purposes, if you have a, a very solid credit history, you ought to have access to a mortgage. That's different than a subprime loan. Same thing with a small business uh, or an entrepreneur who wants to expand their business. And the two aren't completely delinked because one of the ways that entrepreneurs typically had access uh, to credit was through uh, mortgage products. So we still have work to do, um, uh, but that's, uh, that, that's moving in the right direction. I think we're a ways away from, uh, from having to worry about uh, kind of an overhang of, uh, of loose credit in that way. OK, so yes, let's go right here to begin with. Thank you very much. I'm Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council, where I run a program on Iran. And uh, I'm going to read this question because I'm not a banker. <laughs> but I, I spoke to one who is. Um, we've seen a lot of problems with sanctions relief for Iran. And is part of the difficulty because they have dollar assets now in banks in China and India and so on that they are having trouble accessing and using, moving? Or is it because um, banks find it difficult to do transactions without some reference to the dollar? And don't you need to reinstitute at least a limited U-turn so that Iran can avail itself of its own money, which is sitting in primarily Asian banks? You know, we've been very clear that uh, the nuclear sanctions on Iran that limited access uh, to Iran's reserves and to financial institutions were lifted when Iran complied with its nuclear-related obligations <laughs> under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, we have been clear in going uh, around the world, making that point both government to government and to uh, financial institutions. I, Iran uh, has many challenges in doing business. Um, some of them have to do with Iran's own uh, business practices. Some of them have to do with Iran's other activities outside of the nuclear arena where they continue to engage uh, in supporting terrorism, regional destabilization, they, uh, missile testing that is uh, violating uh, norms and, um, and human rights problems that they have in their own country. So there are still sanctions on Iran uh, in those areas uh, while the nuclear sanctions have been lifted. Um, I think that we have to be clear, Iran complied with the nuclear agreement, therefore the nuclear sanctions are lifted. I think that that is a process that is becoming more and more clear uh, and we will keep our part of the bargain there. Um, but the U.S. financial system is not open to Iran, uh, and that is not something that is going to change. Uh, so the challenge is going to be how to work through uh, a, an international financial system that is complicated, where there are uh, is a lot of attention paid 
to uh, what U.S. law requires. And I think our obligation is to be clear, which I've tried very hard to do and our team has tried very hard to do. Um, you know, if you look at uh, what makes a sanctions regime work, uh, a sanctions regime works if um, in order to get relief from the sanctions, the government changes its policy. So the government of Iran changed its policy. That's why we lifted uh, the sanctions that were nuclear sanctions. The government of Iran has not uh, changed its behavior in all of those other areas. And there still are other sanctions in place. And navigating through that is going to be a challenge, but it's one where I think clarity will help. Uh, we're not proposing uh, that the U-turn uh, be changed. Stephen Murray. Stephen is there. Behind you, sir. Behind you. Thank you, Sebastian. Steve Myro, Beacon Policy Advisors. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, given the premise that global leadership begins here at home, I'd like to ask for a second about the Puerto Rican debt crisis. I know that uh, your Treasury Department has been working closely with the House Natural Resources Committee on legislation. It sounds like we might get a new bill as early as today. Uh, what we're hearing is that Republicans in Congress, to get on board, will probably push for uh, 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 a weaker restructuring authority where they have collective action clauses plus the litigation stay. And if you combine that with the debt moratorium that uh, the island itself has been preparing, is that something that Treasury can get behind? There's still an ongoing uh, process. Uh, people were working through the weekend uh, on it, and I don't believe it's uh, completed yet. Um, what we've been very clear about is that the only way for Puerto Rico to resolve the situation it faces is for there to be a comprehensive restructuring of the debt. And that along with that, there needs to be a very strong oversight board to make sure that Puerto Rico continues on a path, gets on a path, and stays on a path that can be sustained. Um, there are a lot of details, but when you get down to the bottom line, the question to us is, does that restructuring authority work? It has to work or it's not going to be acceptable. It, won't, it can't be something that you put a label on, but in the marketplace doesn't work. There's still some open issues. Um, I, we've had a very good working relationship on a bipartisan basis, working through many, many technical issues. Uh, but there are still a number of very difficult issues that are open that if resolved in the right way will lead to a bipartisan support. But if not resolved in the right way, just won't work. And we're not going to support something that doesn't work. Another Steve here. Uh, uh, micro microphone, microphone. I do have a question, but if it's OK with you, I would yield to Dr. Rivlin. OK. Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, you've been very clear uh, about the connection uh, between US economic leadership and uh, uh, trade and international organizations. But US economic leadership is a very abstract concept. And it's pretty clear to people in this room. It's not clear to the general public. And indeed, it seems uh, to conflict with the people who are cheering, let's make America great again. So my basic question is, <laughs> How do you establish the connection between U.S. Con uh, economic leadership in the world and uh, a strong U.S. economy, which is uh, clearly what everybody wants? Look, it's, a, it's obviously a very important question. Um, uh, we know that jobs that are supported by trade uh, pay better than jobs that are not supported by trade. We know that a world where markets are closed to the United States is going to lead to a less well-performing U.S. economy. That's not necessarily broadly embraced now. Uh, I think, frankly, one of the things we have to do is be more clear about what are the standards that are going to be in place in countries like the TPP countries that sign on. What does it mean to extend uh, higher labor standards in a country like Vietnam? Um, these are somewhat abstract questions, but if you have high labor standards in the United States and low labor standards in other countries, it means the other countries are always going to have lower costs and be able to outcompete you. As the other countries raise their standards and meet our kinds of labor concerns and our kinds of environmental concerns and our kinds of business practice concerns, the playing field becomes more level uh, for the U.S. to compete better. I actually think one of the challenges we have is how to make sure that 
uh, things like trade adjustment assistance don't just get public attention at the moment when there's an effort to pass a trade promotion authority bill or a, a, a trade agreement. There has to be attention on those issues in the intervening years. We tend to have challenges getting our system to focus on these things, except at the moments when we're trying to get approval for uh, trade legislation. I think the fact that we could get a majority of Congress to support a trade promotion authority just a few months ago is quite significant. Um, I think all of us who believe that the benefits of U.S. economic leadership are profound, both in economic and geopolitical terms, have more work to do to make the case uh, uh, to, to people who have legitimate worries about uh, an economy that has, uh, for decades now, um, not necessarily uh, provided uh, the kind of opportunity to middle class uh, workers uh, and their families that they want to have and they have a right to expect. That's not all because of trade. Uh, I think trade has become uh, one of the things that's easy to point to, but it, it, be, between globalization and uh, technological change and income uh, concentration, We've seen an awful lot of change in our country in the last uh, 25 years. And I think if we address those root issues uh, by having better education, more skills for the economy of the future, uh, infrastructure that will make it easier to get to the jobs you need. If, if you don't live near the jobs that are available, the burden of getting the job is hard. If you can't travel there because there's no mass transit or the roads take two hours instead of 35, 40 minutes, uh, it becomes a real hurdle to your own personal mobility. So I think we have a lot of domestic things we could do to concentrate on building our economy in a way that gives people real confidence in their own economic future. And I actually think most of the kinds of things I've just described are the kinds of things which you can have bipartisan consensus on. If it was in the context of an overall you know, fiscal approach where you had resources to address problems that have bipartisan um, uh, support to address. The challenge on infrastructure now isn't that people don't want better roads and better ports and better airports, it's how to pay for it. So it really comes back, as you and I both know, to where does the money come from? And, um, and hopefully, you know, the work of the last several years has moved us back towards a more mainstream conversation of those issues. Uh, we saw it at the end of last year, um, and I certainly hope that continues. Uh, what strikes me about Alice Rivlin's question is that um, she's plainly correct that uh, parts of the primary debate are surfacing fairly powerful uh, skepticism about globalization and international engagement. It's also true in uh, Europe that um, animosity towards supranational economic institutions is at an all-time high. I mean, the very cohesion of the European Union is in, is in doubt. Um, but actually, the interesting thing is that uh, we're having this conversation in the sense that I can remember some of your predecessors who would uh, be making a speech essentially saying that the Bretton Woods institutions uh, have allowed themselves to become you know, uh, irrelevant, bordering on archaic, and really they need to be either scrapped or radically changed. And I would be asking the questions, but isn't there some value in it? And you've taken the opposite position, uh, wholeheartedly supporting them and supporting the international system, and I'm in, therefore in the position of you know, <laughs> prodding you to defend that position. So I think there is an interesting flip in yeah. some sense. But I can on. point to just two things in this last year that, that, that kind of partially answer Alice's question but address yours. Um, we made enormous progress in the G20 this year on base erosion and profit shifting. That's closing the tax loopholes that allow you know, the legal uh, shifting of money to low or no tax uh, environments. We've seen just in this last week the outrage of people around the world because those kinds of opportunities exist. You know, we in the United States have taken a leadership role in doing things to try and make it more transparent who the real owners are putting in place tax information sharing agreements that make it easier for tax authorities to cooperate. But getting the G20 to agree uh, in this area, we made more progress in the last year than in the last 20 years uh, on that issue. On um, things like the Financial Action Task Force, working on a global basis to try and put real you know, barriers in the way 
of anyone trying to use the international financial system for illicit or, um, or malign purposes. We have a lot more work to do, but we had a meeting uh, at the UN Security Council in December where there was a unanimous resolution on the subject, and it was the United States and Russia jointly sponsoring it. You know, so th we have work to do. It's not that, that, that we've achieved everything we need to, nor that anyone sitting here in my role will ever be able to say we've achieved everything. But you have to adapt to the challenges of the future. If we could address this um, you know, issue of taxes becoming stateless income, you know, income that never gets taxed, I think it would help address some of the, the, the international sentiment that uh, the system um, uh, doesn't seem fair. Uh, so I think the fact that we've worked on that is very important. We'd have to demonstrate it uh, by making real progress. Um, yeah, let's go right here. Hi, Rachel Oswald with Congressional Quarterly. A follow-on to uh, Barbara's question earlier. Um, there have been a couple of bills filed in Congress um, to address the U-turn concern to make it illegal. What are your thoughts on those measures, given that you have just said there are no plans to allow limited U-turns at this point? So what, what we have said, what the President said uh, about 10 days ago, uh, is that we will work on an international basis to make sure that uh, financial institutions and other governments understand what the lifting of the nuclear sanctions mean and to provide the guidance that's necessary for Iran to get access uh, to resources and to transactions that it has a right to with the nuclear <coughs> sanctions being lifted. And that's what we're doing. I'm not going to address hypotheticals uh, in terms of, uh, of any other uh, actions. Um, let's go, oh, yes, right here, on the, yeah. Uh, in front of you, yeah, good, yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, David Apgar, Inter-American Development Bank Group. Thank you very much. Let me uh, ask a question that brought in Sebastian's earlier question and lets you expand a little bit on, on development. Those of us in the, in the, in the business focus on our hard-won successes. But outside of uh, Washington, the view that development is broken has probably never been more widespread, and not without reason. You know, his, now we look back in history and see wave after wave of competing approaches to development uh, have, uh, have um, not provably had an effect. And what has had more effect than anything in recent experience were the efforts of the Chinese party, uh, the Communist Party in China to, to lift uh, uh, lift uh, hundreds of millions of people out of out of poverty. So, the, the uh, this pessimism isn't all bad. It's encouraged the private sector to step up uh, with a, a whole movement of impact investment. But what I'm wondering is, given your uh, understanding of bilateral aid from your from your your previous position in the State Department and and your understanding of multilateral efforts, given where you sit now, are there any deep changes that might break the cycle? of development ineffectiveness that you see? Well, first, I, I'm, I wouldn't accept the premise that our experience in development has been um, ineffective. It has not been perfect, um, and certainly some things have worked better than others, but the countries where you've seen the biggest rise out of poverty have been very much the countries that have been beneficiaries of lending from institutions like the World Bank, and in many cases, recipients of bilateral aid. Um, I think that the, 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 what, you know, the, when I was at the State Department, um, what I saw when I looked around the world was a big challenge of coordinating different streams of development assistance. That uh, in, in, a, in a host country, it wasn't always clear what the goals were and uh, who was working with whom. Uh, you know, working even within the United States, we try very hard to coordinate the bilateral and the multilateral efforts that we have underway uh, so that we have maximum advantage. It's something that we looked at when I was at the State Department from the perspective of having responsibility for the bilateral development assistance and where I sit now, largely responsibility for the multilateral development assistance. But look at something like climate change. Look at the, the, the conference I mentioned in Addis Ababa, Funding for Development. I don't think you could have imagined 10 years ago that you would have had a gathering like the Funding for Development Conference where three principles came out of it um, as being equally critical. One was that there's a need for ongoing official development assistance. Secondly, that there's a need for host government investment in the same priorities. 
And third, that there has to be public-private partnership in order to get the full leverage necessary to achieve the goals. I think that is a, a very important uh, foundational element to the COP21 agreements in Paris, and it's an important concept as we go forward. You can't look at any of these things in isolation. The question is, when you put them together, do they give you the results that you're looking for? But I, I think it's a mistake to, to, to think that everything has been a great success, but it's certainly a big mistake to think that everything has been a big failure. We have to adapt and learn how to take the best of what we've accomplished and build on that uh, for the future. I'll go back to Steve, so generosity should be rewarded. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Steve Charnovitz, George Washington University. In your essay and your remarks, you've uh, highlighted uh, the work of the World Bank on, on climate change. The question I wanted to ask you is about the World Bank role in human rights. Uh, recently, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights criticized the World Bank for being a human rights-free zone. So I wanted to ask you your, your reaction to that criticism and what do you think the proper role for human rights in World Bank lending is? One of the, the um, U.S. Um, interests uh, in the World Bank in recent years has been to make sure that there is a proper focus on the um, conditions in the countries, both in terms of, of human rights, but also in terms of the impact uh, on uh, the community uh, of the, 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 the investments that are being made. Um, you know, th that is something that we have been pushing with a great deal of support from Congress. Uh, and I think it's something that helps guide the World Bank <coughs> as it moves forward. Um, it is uh, a challenge uh, in many countries uh, uh, to get uh, along the, 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 the path of progress on an economic, political, human rights field all at the same time. But that's not an excuse for not pushing in the right direction and for having standards uh, of, uh, of what is acceptable uh, progress. So it's an area where we will continue to press. I don't think that's a fair characterization uh, of the World Bank, but again, I don't think it's fair to say that uh, in all of the countries where the World Bank uh, lends, uh, the practices are yet where they need to get. Um, these are countries that are developing countries in every uh, regard uh, in many cases. Uh, and in our bilateral programs, you know, we tie aid um, to progress, um, and we press for those kinds of standards uh, in international settings as well. Um, last question, we'll go to the lady in the green shirt there. Porter McConnell from the Financial Transparency Coalition. Thank you, Secretary Liu, for, for coming to speak with us. Um, a question you sort of alluded to in the OECD's base of and profit shifting scheme. Um, I guess what I'd like to push you on is that there's a sense, you know, when I think of America's economic leadership, I think of rule of law, I think of transparency, I think of respect for small and medium enterprise. Um, when I talk to my colleagues abroad, they have a pretty different picture right now. Um, they see a great place to hide illicit cash with no questions asked. Um, the big scandal around the Panama Papers was less that you could do this in Panama, but that so many Americans didn't need to do it in Panama because they could do it in Delaware or Nevada. So I guess I'd love to hear from you what you would say to those critics about the, the credibility gap there. Look, I, I think that um, you know, we have uh, a tax system um, that is uh, amongst the best in the world uh, and uh, is a standard that others aspire to in terms of its independence and uh, its, its reach. Um, the, the, you know, we have uh, put in place uh, you know, the ability to, to, to see what people's different income streams are. If it's not subject to tax, that's a policy issue, not a, 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 a kind of transparency uh, issue. Um, you know, we are working uh, globally uh, to make sure that there's a sharing of tax information. Um, the, you know, the, the, the word FATCA is now an international word because the United States adopted uh, the policy of making uh, it obligatory on all countries to share tax information so that you can't hide um, uh, income. 
we're not all the way there. The base erosion work we did uh, was critically important, but uh, I seem to keep coming back to the meetings in uh, Addis Ababa, but another thing that came up at those meetings that was critically important was how weak the systems are internationally in so many countries and how much technical assistance countries need to build the kinds of uh, tax authorities so that you can work with them to make sure that those gaps uh, don't develop. Um, you know, we've pledged to double our uh, Office of Technical Assistance support. Uh, we work closely with the IMF and other bilateral uh, partners. Uh, but we're making real progress there. We have more work uh, to do. I think that the idea that um, there's different rules uh, depending on uh, kind of where you are in the, in the hierarchy is unacceptable. Everyone has to follow the law. And if the laws permit um, the movement of income to you know, countries or places where they're inadequately taxed, then that's a tax policy question that we have to address, which is one of the reasons that we've proposed a business tax reform uh, so that the U.S. broken tax system would be fixed and we would tax all uh, U.S. income wherever it is in the world at a reasonable level and close the loopholes uh, that make our system as broken as it is. We right now have a tax system that forces companies to look for ways to avoid a statutory tax rate that's the highest in the developed world, even though our effective tax rate is about average because of the impact of uh, the system of, of uh, deductions and credits, which some were worthy when they were put in place. Uh, many are, uh, have outlived their usefulness. Some weren't necessarily useful uh, when they were put in place. <laughs> so we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, but I think our economic leadership uh, in, in this area is still profoundly important. And um, in the base erosion and profit shifting debate, you know, we've been right at the heart of it uh, globally. So the world has more work to do here. We collectively have more work to do here. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, uh, you know, we've made progress, uh, and we will continue to make progress. Well, Mr. Secretary, you've taken us from uh, Bretton Woods to the Panama Papers with many stops in Addis Ababa on the way. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Great to be with you, Sebastian. Thanks.